I'm Rick Hassan. I'm a professor at UC Irvine School of Law, where I specialize in election law. Well, the system we have set up is that we make the Supreme Court just about the final arbiter on uh, constitutional questions. Very difficult to overturn a Supreme Court constitutional decision. Constitutional amendments are very difficult. They require a supermajority of Congress, supermajority of state legislatures, or, or a constitutional convention, which we've never had. And so the court is pretty much final on constitutional questions. And so uh, it is true that the Supreme Court is the ultimate political regulator, not only in campaign finance, but in terms of how much political gerrymandering there should be, uh, what counts as racial gerrymandering, when can race be taken into account in drawing lines, what kind of political primaries are allowed, They're all across a range of areas. The, the Supreme Court has been the most important actor when it comes to political regulation. Well, we can go back to the 1960s when the court passes the one, when the court decides the one person, one vote rule. Uh, starting in Baker versus Carr, where the court says these cases are justiciable, and moving to cases like Reynolds versus Sims, where they say you can't have vastly unequally sized uh, districts for electing legislators. That's the Supreme Court as uh, what I've called uh, the mighty platonic guardians, to go back to quote uh, uh, Judge Learned Hand. Uh, we have given the court a great deal of power uh, in this area as a as a country, and uh, it's really inevitable that, that most political reforms cannot be enacted in this country unless they pass through the, the, and get the approval of the Supreme Court. When it comes to the question of polarization in the Supreme Court, I think the first thing I would have to point out is that the current Supreme Court is polarized itself. You have five justices appointed by Republican presidents who are all conservative. You have four justices appointed by Democratic presidents who are all liberal. It hasn't been this way. I mean, you don't have to go back that far. You can go back to Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, Justice White. They didn't vote the way you'd expect someone from a political party would. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the Supreme Court is a partisan body. I don't think when the justices, individually or collectively, are deciding how to vote on cases, they are consciously deciding what's good for my party. But I do think that the ideological division that's reflected in our politics is also reflected at the Supreme Court. That is, the reason a John Roberts or an Elena Kagan is nominated is precisely because their views tend to line up with the views of that of their party. And so by voting sincerely, they play a part in this polarized politics. And so it's not a surprise that on the most important issues of the day, think abortion, think guns, think campaign finance, gay rights. For the most part, the court is dividing along political and ideological lines in the same way that Congress or presidents do. That's sort of a, uh, a necessary uh, car corollary to our partisan polarized politics. Presidents are going to nominate people who are going to reflect the views of the party. And then it has a long tail. Someone's appointed to the Supreme Court in the 1950s. They could be on the court 20, 30, 40 years, especially with uh, how long the lifespan is now. And so even as our polarized politics might fade, they might continue on the Supreme Court for decades. Well, I think if you look at the conservative justice on the court, they see campaign finance limits as censorship and incumbency protection and a means of squelching especially conservative views. And I think the liberals on the court see a different problem. They see money in politics as creating a problem of unequal access to political power. And so it's really a fundamental divide between two different worldviews over what the effect of money in politics are and what the biggest risk is. So to conservatives, the biggest risk is censorship and squelching of political speech. To the liberals, the concerns are, I think, both corruption and domination of the process by wealthy individuals and corporations. And so there's very little middle ground between those two positions.
Now, we often think of or talk about Justice Kennedy as the swing justice on the court. On the issue of campaign finance, he's no swing justice. He is the author of Citizens United. He recently gave a speech at Harvard where he reflected about how things have not worked out the way he would have hoped in, in Citizens United. And some people read that as Justice Kennedy expressing regret about his decision. I don't read it that way. I read him as saying, uh, I think the solution to the problem of money in politics is disclosure. And Congress should come in and pass better disclosure laws. The Supreme Court has said time and again, disclosure is constitutional. Unless, as a particular individual or group, you could demonstrate a risk of, of, um, uh, of harassment, then you can get an exemption. I think Justice Kennedy would like a system of no limits and would like a system of full disclosure. The other thing that's said, and I know that uh, we've had a lot of politicians uh, on the right say this, uh, that super PACs, these outside groups that are spending money, they're really problematic. The candidates can't control the message. And the solution uh, for these politicians is more money right into the hands of the candidates themselves, more control. So rather than giving a million dollars to the uh, pro-Smith uh, super PAC, give the money right to Smith. Uh, that raises, I think, greater concerns about corruption. I've said the corruption concerns are overblown, but that would raise a concern about corruption. Uh, it also raises the same concerns about uh, equality. If you are somebody who is a million dollar donor, you get access uh, in a way that others don't. You get a chance to, uh, a better chance to elect your candidate and a better chance to make your pitch if that candidate is elected. And just the threat of spending a million dollars will have a, a, an effect on what those who might be on the wrong side of that will be willing to do. Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy has said ingratiation, access, or not corruption. And he may be right, depending on how he defines corruption. But it still doesn't mean it's, uh, it's okay for our democracy. I think it raises serious concerns about equality. So there's really an unbridgeable divide on the Supreme Court right now. And so the way to change this is, I think, not to try to persuade Justice Kennedy, which, right, that's the strategy. Talking gay marriage, you're talking Obamacare, you're, you know, you're looking, you're writing your brief for Justice Kennedy. I don't think that's a strategy that would work in the campaign finance area. Instead, it would require changing the Supreme Court. And that's why I think the upcoming presidential election is so important in terms of the future of the Supreme Court. When the next president takes office uh, about a year from now, uh, there will be three justices over the age of 80. One justice will be 78. There's a chance, especially if that president has a second term, that that new president will be able to appoint one, two, three, or four justices to the Supreme Court, thereby potentially shifting the balance of power for up to a generation. And so it's a really important election in terms of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's not a really salient election issue, but it's too bad because no matter what you care about, whether it's abortion, guns, immigration, environmental law, campaign finance, affirmative action, everything goes through the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has so much power in our country, but you know the, the court's uh, decisions are written in a legalistic language that's hard to understand. The court's oral arguments are not televised. It's, the court is this opaque body that makes very important decisions that are really outside the, the understanding of the public. And so it's, it's hard to make it an election issue, but I do think it is... Uh, as I've written, uh, the most important civil rights issue of the 2016 election is the composition of the Supreme Court.